and Nick Mitchell. Uh, they've been working uh, both uh, in the activist practices, but also in uh, creating a really exciting manifesto, abolitionist manifesto, uh, which um, I read and found incredibly uh, fitting with the times and uh, and so we'll uh, this is the second iteration of uh, the session of radical pedagogy of the Institute of Radical Imagination. Last time we had a conversation with people from the Movimento dos Enterra, the Landless Movement in Brazil, the Bachillerados Populares and the um, Academic for Peace in Istanbul uh, thinking about pedagogies of the South and today we will think we will push it a little bit more further to uh, think together about abolitionism in university and hopefully what uh, can be done for the next uh, stage for more uh, uh, egalitarian modes of study. Um, so I leave it to, to the group and uh, I think there will be first the presentation of the manifesto and then a response to, uh, from Max Aiden. And, um, and then hopefully we will have a a little bit of discussion after that. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for having us. We're um, really excited to be here if I speak for uh, my uh, co-authors. Um, so the way that we're going to do this is, I guess, um, so I am going to go first and then I believe Abby Boggs is going to go next. And I think we've got uh, Zach Schwartz-Weinstein in the third position and batting cleanup, uh, Eli Meyerhoff, because we all like baseball metaphors. Um, and so uh, I will get started. Are, are we doing a, a Prezi or are we going to do, I, I, I forget if we're, 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 maybe we don't have the visual element. Okay, so. We, we I, can't, I, I don't currently have screen sharing. Um, okay. So if that, that's an option, if yeah, oh. I, I'm good now. Yep, I will share my screen. I'm co -host I'll try now. to at least do it properly. Okay. We'll see. <laughs> There's a challenge. Um, there we go. All right, and I am going to get out of full screen so I can read a thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so. Uh, by way of opening, and this is a kind of a, a discussion of our, our, our project partly drawn um, from a piece uh, called Abolitionist University Studies and Invitation, and also kind of uh, uh, incorporating a discussion of our co collective work, including something that's uh, work we're engaged in called the Cops Off Campus Research Project. Um, so by way of opening, we'd like to remark on the continued need to speak of universities in terms of land not only in terms of campuses physically located on land, but of institutions powered by fossil fuels extracted from it, of disciplinary ideologies that separate people from it, of university knowledge production that devalues lives lived in relation to it. This seems especially important to acknowledge given the fact that we're not gathered in a single space. The seeming extraterritoriality of the Zoom university risks reproducing the idea that we don't need to deal with questions of land in the same way. Uh, through Zoom, we may not appear to have a common relationship to the continued land expropriation projects that are universities in settler space, but from a different perspective, Zoom connectivity, appearing as it does to liberate collectivity from the need to share space, attests the continuation of settler dynamics rather than their displacement. Though Zoom appears as if it's peer-to-peer -peer software, it's probably better described as an accumulation hardware project whose primary function is to obs obscure its existence as um, as an accumulation uh, project. Um, Zoom's uh, 17 data centers uh, located across the globe to daily uh, store the equivalent of 93 years of high definition videos. In what comes, we'll have more to say about such accumulation projects. As co-authors, we collaborated and developed our, the arguments of this piece on Ohlone land, on Wong land of Matabeset, on Okanichi Saponi land, on Mohawk and Mohican land. As co-authors, we learn new ways of being unsettled by the logics of the university that seek to organize knowledge as a substitute and an alternative to justice. In this acknowledgement, we hope to make space to continue this unsettlement. These complexities and complicities are part of what this project is a response to. Most university histories reproduce them in one way or another. 
This is not a project of restoration, redemption, or absolution, though it may be a project of transformation. It's also decidedly not a nostalgic project, yet it's also not a project without hope. In taking up the language of abolition, we seek to reckon with the U.S. University's enduring complicity with the logics and practices of carcerality, settler colonialism, and racial capitalism, while at the same time asking what kinds of spaces, relationships, ways of knowing, and even institutions an abolitionist approach to the university could bring into being. In what follows, we lay out a conceptual, fr conceptual framework through which to approach uh, an abolitionist university studies that's especially attentive to questions of periodization and informed by a historical materialist interest in modes and regimes of accumulation. We begin with the discussion of the most dominant periodization in contemporary work on the university represented by work in critical university studies, which focuses largely on eras following World War II and sometimes the 1890s. We then propose an alternative periodization by highlighting how the university's dominant modes of accumulation have changed across history along with shifts in broader regimes of accumulation. In this framing, we argue for the importance of understanding what we call the post-slavery university. By centering this new concept, we aim to emphasize the unfinished work of the abolitionist movement by situating U.S. universities after the Civil War as continuous with a broader terrain of struggles pitting what Du Bois called the counter-revolution of capital and property against abolitionism and reconstruction. In other words, with the formal end of slavery, capital aspired to use the post-slavery university for accumulation by other means. Bringing our periodization up to the present, we analyze the university's dominant modes of accumulation within the broader contemporary accumulation regime, individual accumulation and individualization itself through education, institutional accumulation, the circulation of capital, the expropriation of labor, and the non-circulation of wages, i.e. from the perspective of students' wageless labor. We conclude by raising questions for a constructive university abolitionism, asking how an abolitionist perspective can highlight spaces of organizing, resistance, subversion, and accumulation toward non-capitalist ends within, through, and in relation to universities. By developing a specifically abolitionist approach to the universities, its histories, its present, and its futures, and in conversation with you and with others, we want to build an abolition university. We invite you to join us. We call for bringing in abolitionism to the university aligned with a left abolitionist tendency. Expressed most strongly in recent years with the movement to abolish prisons and police, seeing these violent institutions, violent institutions as continuations of slavery by another name. Leftist abolitionisms have always been both destructive, dismantling racial capitalism, and constructive, building alternatives from the abolition democracy of reconstruction to today's project seeking to, to divert people's attachments for, to prisons and police into alternative practices of community accountability, safety, and transformative justice. Abolition offers the alternative uh, or, or offers the occasion for thinking about the university in ways that the institution itself might otherwise render impossible. And in doing so, it may offer an occasion to trouble the institution as we know and inhabit it and as it inhabits us. What follows then is a shift, an attempt to shift our relationship to that anxiety. We're looking to a different, we're, we're looking to find a different path to the question of what an abolitionist approach to the university might say yes to. In moving toward this position, we're inspired by us, uh, by Stefano Harney and Fred Moten's call to reinterpret abolitionism as, uh, in their words, not so much the abolition of prisons, but the abolition of a society that could have prisons, that could have slavery, that could have the wage, and therefore not abolition as the elimination of anything, but abolition as the founding of a new society. They sense a new abolitionism, a positive world-making one lurking in the university's undercommons. We're also thinking with Dylan Rodriguez on the abolitionist politics within and, and in relationship to the academy. We share his ambivalence about the possibilities for transforming these institutions, but like him, we also hold on to the radical creativity that can come from the standpoint position in and of itself. This work is further animated by W.E.B. Du Bois and Angela Davis's respective conceptualization of abolition democracy. For Du Bois, abolition democracy marked, in his words, the grand unrealized potential of social and economic change initiated during the Reconstruction era. 
For Davis, it enabled a proposal for what she called the, uh, the creation of an array of social institutions that would begin to solve the social problems that set people on the track to prisons, th thereby helping to render prison obsolete. Along the lines of this constructive abolitionism, we envision an abolition university. What kinds of spaces, relationships, ways of knowing, and even institutions might such imagining render possible? Davis, Moten, Harney, and Rodriguez are just a few of the many thinkers who animate our efforts to embrace abolition as a generative rather than merely negative project. We aim to build relations that steal the sheen from the university's romanticized history and to repurpose its resources, capacity, capacities, and function of reproducing sociality. This generative abolitionism requires seeing how the politics of universities are bound up with the politics of memory, itself an accumulative process. Being open about our abolitionist perspective, we push back against these depoliticizing histories by revealing their politics as well as the role of universities in their authorization. We approach the history and social function of colleges and universities with a keen awareness of the ways such institutions and the knowledge they enable, proffer, and archive are fundamentally conditioned by modes of, modes of studying, remembering, and imagining limited by and indebted to white supremacist, heterosexist, ableist, settler colonial, capitalist epistemologies. An abolitionist approach unearths the counter memories of people who have been buried in the dominant histories, people who have resisted the dominant world making project and created alternatives. We also draw a line between our project and much of critical university studies, the decade or so old scholarly formation, which has now established a meaningful institutional footprint in intellectual impact. We're inspired by, but also break with much of this work because we see critical university studies as haunted by its allegiance to a crisis consensus, fueled by nostalgia for the post-war post public mass university. In its reliance on a periodization that yearns for a return to the so-called golden era of the mid 20th century, critical university studies conjures the imagined goodness of an expansive and expanding public university system flush with federal and state support. Here, the university exists as a redistributive mechanism or redistributive institution through which the masses can acquire upward social mobility. Almost invariably, however, the story neglects the ways this expansion was underwritten by militarized funding priorities, nationalist agendas, and an incorporative project of counter insurgency. Our contention with what we regard as the, the dominant critical university studies periodization is this. It's understandable interest in critiquing the neoliberal backlash against the mid 20th century public university can only be secured by discursively inflating the democratic potentiality, righteousness, and innocence of that institution. It thus relies on a periodization and on a set of geopolitical parameters that produce the appearance of justice by cropping out the violence constitutive of the institution itself. This framework also tends to neglect the role of universities in major, major economic projects of its time designed to direct and manage the anticipation and actuality of post-war sur surpluses of capital and population. Critical university studies romanticizing of the post-war period as a moment of democratic possibility in the university seems especially curious when confronted with leftist writings from the very moment the field idealizes. Many left theoreticians of that period referred to the university as imperialist and as, uh, as Mario Savio famously put it, an odious machine. Others left explosives at the offices and homes of its administrators and set its buildings aflame. In attempting to limb the shape of an abolitionist university studies, we've sought to take such theoretical legacies seriously. Too, hemphy, too heavy an emphasis on and too uh, methodologically nationalist surrendering of the public university of the mid 20th century celebrates the institution by distancing it from genocidal domestic and foreign policy it both authorized and required. And with that, I'm gonna pass the baton to Abby. Thank you. Um, so to invoke the language of abolitionism is to position this project in relationship to and in continuity with the abolitionist movements of the 19th century, which works not only to abolish slavery, but also to establish an abolition democracy. The 19th century story of the university allows us to get to the question of what the university is in a way that starting in the 20th century may turn us away from. Recent scholarship on the university enables just such a shift revealing the U.S. Academy's roots in white supremacist, supremacist settler colonial capitalism and insisting that the contemporary work on the present 
uh, circumstances and future possibilities of the university must grapple with these foundations. Key examples of this work are kind of shown here, but they include Craig Stephen Wilder's Ebony and Ivy, Le Paperson's A Third University is Possible, and many universities' historical self-reckonings, such as the Scarlet and Black Project out of Rutgers University and UVA's, uh, Lemon Pro uh, UVA's University of Studying Slavery Consortium and William & Mary's Lemon Project. To varying degrees and ends, such work uh, documents the vast extent to which universities and colleges were materially dependent upon the dispossession and exploitation of Black and Native peoples, Native American peoples, their labor and their land, while concomitantly authorizing the very language, knowledge formations which made such actions, uh, through, through which such actions were rationalized. But this work is not uniformly abolitionist. Many recent efforts by a number of well-resourced elite universities to acknowledge their historical complicities with, and in many cases, active involvement in slavery and the slave trade have taken the form of public relations campaigns, partly because they were able to take for granted the progress narrative put into play by, the, by many accounts of the golden era, in which the university's social function is taken for granted as ameliorative. These efforts are, are able to presume a university past that is radically discontinuous with the university present. Uh, through reports and public statements, special task forces on, on university history, and the renaming of buildings, the knowledge form itself is thus called upon to do the work of redress. Brand management, today's university officials understand, involves owning one's own institutional history. But to own one's own history at this moment offers an instructive lesson in the processes of accumulation at the very heart of the university as a historical entity. In Marx and the Marxist tradition, um, accumulation offers a key concept in thinking the process and linking the process whereby capital is produced and valorized and with the historical uh, development of capitalism. In shorthand, to pay attention to accumulation offers an approach keyed to the practice of confronting capitalism and its apologists with its own historical conditions of possibility. More recently, rich traditions of anti-colonial critique and histories of slavery have insisted that the violence of expropriation made cap that made capitalism possible are not external features of it. Rather, these are the internal these, these are internal features of its logic. Accumulation is therefore the manifest condition of an entire range of overlapping forces and arrangements, war, patriarchy, colonial violence and dis displacement, enslavement, enclosure, and education. These forces, often held at an analytic remove from the purely economic, created the differential distributions of life, land, death, debt, power, wealth, and self that were necessary for capitalist production to emerge and reproduce itself over time. To approach the university through this understanding of accumulation, moreover, is to view accumulation in a way that does not reduce it to the accumulation of capital. It is rather to specify the university's particular function in the disciplining and management of non-capitalist, non-capital surpluses, such as population and living labor. We think this perspective on the university as, and as an outcome of, institutional accumulation can also generate a means of discerning productive and surprising continuities between universities and other institutions that do not necessarily share the same social standing or prestige in spite of sharing a similar social function. One kind of particularly salient example um, is some of the important functions shared from the perspective in, in, of institutional accumulation between universities and prisons, which partly animate our framing. In this, we're inspired by, Ruthie, by Ruth Wilson Gilmore's account in Golden Gulag of the four surpluses that converged in the process of California's massive project of prison expansion in the 1980s. Surpluses of financed capital, labor, land, and state capacity. Another way of describing this process might be as an instance of institutional accumulation. Comparisons between universities and prisons are always risky, and we get this and we want to acknowledge that, but in some instances they can be illuminating as well. As Amanda Armstrong has shown, Prisons inherited from the universities a strategy of deploying state technologies of debt financed construction. Looking at these two, par uh, two as parallel instances of ins institutional accumulation enable enables us not simply to compare in the sense of rendering equivalent universities and prisons. Rather, it allows us to grasp how each participates in the stratification of wages, of wages life. From the perspective of capital in the abstract, Prisons and universities both offer highly scalable state guaranteed investment opportunities for low interest, low risk bonds that stabilize other riskier investment opportunities. Both universities and prisons are capable of effectively disappearing surplus populations. Both universities and prisons uh, from the labor force and thereby vanishing capital's structural generation of, of unemployment. 
both universities and prisons demonstrate how surplus lands are made, whether by eminent domain or the termination of agricultural production that leads to their repurposing as large scale social investments. This perspective allows us to forego some of the ideological sheen that the university arrogates to itself as a function of its own historical privilege. Oh, it's okay. Um, by taking up this more capacious understanding of accumulation, the abolitionist university studies we envision can also attend to other kinds of accumulated pro cumulative practices, ones that exist and operate alongside, within, and against the accumulative function of capitalism in the service of imagining and making alternative ways of being and worlds. These forms of accumulation might also include the accumulation of debt, financial and otherwise. Sorry. Yep, I was ahead, sorry about that. Uh, forms of debt, financial and otherwise, um, of suspect and subjugated knowledges of untoward relationships. For Moton and Harney, for instance, the accumulation of bad debt, the debt that cannot or simply will not ever be paid, is the very condition of possibility, the very principle upon which a fugitive public can form. This is uh, if, as they write, credit is a means of privatization, then debt is a means of socialization. It is a social, it is mutual. How might such a counterintuitive approach to the question of accumulation um, help us scavenge the parts of the university we want to hold on to and make use of? What modes of retaining knowledge of, of and relationships to past struggles and solidarities while remaining cognizant of the various ways they condition our present and future can or m must an abolitionist approach enable? And now I do pass to Zach. An abolitionist perspective highlights spaces of organizing, resistance, subversion, and accumulation toward non-capitalist ends in, through, and in relation to universities. Current activism in the university and the trajectory of abolitionism has paired Moton and Hardy's fugitivity with an abolitionist world making that actively confronts the post-slavery university, even as it exceeds the boundaries of the campus. This organizing is heterogeneous and takes many forms, but at its core embraces what Rodriguez has called a concept of abolition that is inseparable from its roots in feminist queer black liberation and feminist queer indigenous anti-colonialism slash decolonization. As examples, we would point to the organization Critical Resistance, the most important prison abolitionist organization in the US over the last 23 years co-founded by activists, academics, incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people, feminists and LGBT plus radicals, whose work has incorporated but also exceeded university-based organizing, appropriating university resources for use in broader struggles against the carceral state. This work is motivated in part by an expansive critique of what Gilmore has called the prison fix, or the way that the prison sutures crises of land, labor, capital accumulation, and surplus population, providing an ephemeral and ideological sidestep around the inequalities generated and sustained by capitalism. To reiterate, we do not mean to suggest here that prisons and universities are the same or that they perform the same functions. Yet it is important to recognize the similarities and links which do exist. Here we point to the way that education works as a fictive fix for the carceral that precludes structural change, the conceptual and political limits of the demand for schools, not jails, a demand which understands the school and, and the jail as distinct and opposite entities, and which therefore misses how the prison and the school and universities so often function in tandem. We would point to critical scholarship, such as that of Gillian Harkins and Erica Miners, on the limits and potential of teaching college and prisons. We are thinking also but um, about other campus-based protest movements on issues of divestment from fossil fuels and prisons, the boycott and divestment and sanctions movement called for by Palestinian civil society, and efforts to divest from ICE and Homeland Security. It's noteworthy, especially in our context today, that activist formations and spaces that take shape outside of the formal sphere of university campuses often take up the label of university to demarcate dedicated spaces of learning and knowledge sharing. One especially salient example in the current historical moment is the formation of Puru Hulu Hulu University, and I apologize for mangling the Native Hawaiian. What its founders claim as an actual place of Native Hawaiian learning as part of a blockade at the base of Mauna Kea. Puru Hulu Hulu University took form when Presley Amuk Sang 
an instructor of Hawaiian language at the University of Hawaii, began teaching classes at the encampment. Within days, it grew, and she started to schedule 20 classes a day on topics ranging from Hawaiian history, language, ethics, and more. Within two weeks, over 100 University of Hawaii faculty became, in, became involved in the project and worked to enable students to earn credits towards their degree as they participated in protests. While the granting of credits for participation in the protest is in one sense a way of being complicit with the individualizing modes of accumulation we discuss above, it might also in another sense exemplify how the abolition university can work within the terms of the university, but toward its own ends. The emergence of this university slash not university formation might be read as an example of the cultivation of what Glenn Coulthard, Yellow Knives Dene, and Liam Simpson, Uchi Sage Nishnabeg have termed grounded normativity, which they describe as how their relationship to the land itself generates the processes, practices, and knowledges that inform their political systems and through which they practice solidarity. While Coulthard and Simpson are primarily attentive to how a relationship to the land is generative, it is also worth thinking about what such a generative process allows to accumulate and from there to consider how such accumulation might also work in a manner that is non-authoritarian, non-dominating, and non-exploitative. What we believe, what we want. The account I've provided here provides in an abstract sense a story of how we ended up where we're at but it offers neither a blueprint for what to do nor a horizon for understanding what an abolitionist relation to the university might look like in practice. The latter, we think, is something that we need. In proposing the precepts for an abolitionist approach to the university, we demarcate a relatively, though not absolutely, open-ended approach to answering in practice that question with which we began. What would an abolitionist approach to the university say yes to? In October 2019, we gathered with a group of over 30 comrades at Duke University to continue to wrestle with the ideas we discuss in our invitation. Over two days of workshops and public convenings, we discussed the implications of the abolitionist university studies framework, asking what gets lost if you don't see the university from the perspective of abolitionism and what is to be gained? Uh, how can it help us think about strategic choices or on how university cited movements should imagine their political constituencies and the kinds of solidarities that they can strive to create. The abolition university recognizes that abstract oppositionality and critique left to their own devices may in fact unwittingly reproduce accumulation regimes by offering their practitioners the sense of moral supremacy, supremacy and social exteriority necessary to imagine knowledge production as a form of change in itself. Instead, we imagine the abolition university as a relation a network and an ethos with various potentials for transforming what and whom the university can be for. And I will pass the mic to Eli. Hey, I'm Eli Meyerhoff. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna talk a bit about what, what we're doing now. Um, yeah, so our, our latest effort is a crowdsourced nationwide research project on the interrelations of universities and policing, what we're calling the Cops Off Campus Database. Over the last few months, in collaboration with a crew of quantitative researchers who've contributed their expertise, we've been creating a data collection tool and a set of lesson plans geared toward organizers, instructors, and students. Annually, policing of colleges and universities is likely a multi-billion dollar industry in the US. We say likely because we honestly don't know how much universities spend on policing. Yet as abolitionist researchers, we think there's lots to, be, to gain by learning to talk about what we don't know, because not knowing presents the opportunity to use research to build abolitionist networks and frameworks. Further, this, this question of how much universities spend barely scratches the surface of what we don't know about universities' relationship to policing. So our, our database and accompanying toolkit are works in progress. We see this project as a way to make the relationship between higher education and policing into a studyable one, and then to help support our fellow travelers in studying it. 
making a problem of this scale studyable requires organizing time and resources. It also requires people who recognize the relationship between universities and police as one that is necessary, urgent really, to study. We want to support a variety of people, as educators, student organizers, community organizers, and others to glimpse the scale of this problem, to dig beneath it, and to share what they learned and how they learned it. So in, in the survey that we're designing for the da database, we're including questions such as, one, how much money do universities invest in policing? Where does that money come from? Does it come from tuition dollars? Does it come from federal grants, donations? Second, where, where do they invest that money? In their own police forces and the enhancement of local policing capacity? Third, what do university police do? What powers do they have? Where is their jurisdiction and toward whom did they exercise those powers? Who gets policed? Fourth, what, what does university policing look like from the perspective of those who are policed? What other transformations and policies accompany it? Five, what specific interests does university investment in policing serve? Does it allow universities to expand their property holdings into new locations? Six, of course, the crucial question for historians, how, how have all these matters changed over time? So to answer these questions, we're, we're looking at different kinds of data including quantitative data about police budgets and student and local demographics, qualitative data about interactions with police on and around campuses, news stories past and present about campus policing, and historical documents and archival data, which, which will require bringing university archivists into the conversation. And we've actually made a guide for how organizers can engage with their university archivists. We see collecting this difficult to access data as an entry point into a larger movement embedded research project. As abolitionist researchers, we're guided by four main principles. First, we think that the best arguments against policing come from paying careful, sustained, and rigorous attention to what police actually do, to the conditions that make them possible, to who benefits most directly from policing, and to whose lives are negatively impacted by it. Second, we believe that the recent wave of uprising, uprisings against policing has taught scholars that when we view policing as a social problem rather than as a solution, there's a lot more to learn about it. We can ask different questions. Third, policing isn't only done by the cops. Policing is a social logic. More and more the logics of policing, including surveillance, repression, and downward distribution of violence, define social institutions. This means that studying policing needs to go beyond just studying the police. This has been especially evident during the COVID-19 pandemic when tuition-dependent universities have reopened despite epidemiologists' warnings. Administrators have been using policing in its myriad forms as a way to deflect blame by turning students into blameworthy subjects who are pressured to regulate and surveil each other with suspicion and vigilance, seeing their peers as disease vectors and reporting risky behavior. Fourth, we believe that we make knowledge by organizing. Knowledge production isn't a substitute for political organizing, but because it involves organizing people at large scale in step with shared beliefs, producing knowledge can powerfully complement large organizing efforts. We envision our project as being in solidarity with and useful for ongoing organizing efforts across campuses, especially the many cops off campus struggles across a range of public and private institutions. An important historical context of our project is in the COLA, or which stands for Cost of Living Adjustment, the COLA wildcat strike at the University of California, Santa Cruz in February and March of this year. Protests often feature the chant, cops off campus, COLA in my bank account. The UCSC grad students were merely demanding livable wages at a university that provides wages that barely cover the rent on a local one bedroom apartment. Yet within the first week of the strike, UCSC's administration spent millions of dollars policing the students' labor action. The chant, cops off campus, coal in my bank account, is the diagnosis of a real problem, and one that extends far beyond the strict confines of the budget. It reminds us that getting rid of the cops is one, a crucial one, but only one part of a broader abolitionist movement. It will need to go hand in hand with efforts to end the extractive practices of charging tuition for education 
will need to work alongside and inter intertwine with other radical struggles against racial colonial capitalism at and beyond campuses. We hope that our database project will help interconnect and strengthen these movements. For more info about this project, you can check out our website at abolition.university. We look forward to being in conversation with you all. Thanks, and I'll, I'll turn it over to, um, to Max now. Max. Thanks so much. Uh, this is such a great project, and uh, I just want to compliment and commend you all for undertaking it. I feel it's such a great project because you, even, even before the moments that we're in right now, I think you all, your, your fidelity to abolitionist principles and uh, movements, I think, led you to develop a project at really at the moment when these, um, these principles and ideas have sort of stormed onto the public stage in a way that they weren't allowed to before, um, which is very exciting. And I think it's like, I'm so glad your project is ongoing in this moment when so many young people are questioning the institutions of, such as the prison, and as it sits a throne, the empire of anti-Black violence and, and racial capitalism. And then also so many students at the same time are questioning, like, why am I paying exorbitant amounts of tuition to go to a university that basically either uh, puts me into a tiny box on a screen for eight hours a day, or puts me into a different kind of box with a bunch of other people basically to fall ill uh, from, from a disease. <laughs> Um, there's a way that I think your, your project is so perfectly situated uh, on the cusp of these two things and really seizes the moment in such an important way. And then also I think gives, gives people working in the university or um, sequestered in the university or conscripted to the university a very practical and meaningful way to get involved by putting their skills of research at the disposal of understanding the role of private and allegedly public security on university campuses. I think it, it gives them the experience of actually doing the abolitionist work of research, of solidarity building and of imagining together. Um, and towards that end, I, I love that the project then also always begs of us that, that amazing abolitionist question, which is like, you know, to begin with the prison, uh, what, what does the prison as a social institution falsely claim to do to us? How is it that it has rendered itself necessary? How is it in fact obsolete? And what would it mean to build now the institutions, relationships and frameworks that would allow that obsolescence to reveal itself and for that institution to collapse? And I think asking those same questions about the university feels so important at this moment because I feel like in both the world that we inhabit together and our own personal lives, the university has been a great machine for stealing dreams um, and enclosing them within its own frameworks and architectures um, for so many people in many different sorts of ways. And so I, what I love so much about this project is it asks us to remember that the university, let, let, and, and building on the undercommons idea, that the university is built on our labors um, that that's, that is the fuel on which it runs. Uh, and yet it falsely claims to us that we need it more than it needs us. And I feel like that your project so wonderfully calls that into question through the doing rather than just through the theory. Um, so that was the first thing I wanted to say in response. Um, the second thing is I've been curious and in my response to this, uh, your documents when you initially published them before we all met about a year ago in, in Durham, I, I've been musing with this question that still vexes me about why, why the university now? Um, and why it is that the university, in spite of the fact that it is a, can sometimes feel like a fairly marginal social institution, has become such a fraught site of economic and political contestation. Uh, and not just from the left. I mean, I think we're comfortable with the ways in which it's become a set of contestation from the left, and there's a long history to that, but how also it's become such an effective um, focal point 
for the the revanchist fantasies of the far right. And I think we can see this on both sides of the Atlantic, um, certainly in this latest election campaign in the United States, we've seen the Trump administration use executive orders to take aim at uh, like critical race theory and other, uh, other monsters of their imagination, um, which is really curious. We've also seen in the U UK during the last election there and subsequently uh, a real way in which the kind of revanchist white supremacist vote uh, of the base of the conservative and Republican parties can be mobilized around this kind of incredible loathing of the university space, which is ironic given how, as you've already pointed out, how incredibly conservative these spaces in fact are on so many levels and how entangled they are with precisely the systems of power of patriarchal uh, racial capitalism and colonialism that they, that these parties would align themselves with. So that's, that's really curious. And I, I still feel like I have more questions than answers about, about why it's become such a hot spot now. And the unfortunate thing I would say about that is that it's then allowed the liberal defenders of the university to claim as they love to do, as liberals always love to do, to claim that they in fact are the most persecuted ones, that the, somehow the liberal middle that's trying to bring us back to the post-war utopia they tell us existed are the true victims because they're being attacked by both the left and the right, et cetera, et cetera. I'm curious why that rhetoric and why that discourse is so effective or if it's so effective in this, in this moment. Likewise, I'm curious as to what may happen to the university after, after, whenever after begins, maybe we're already in after, after COVID. Um, and my, my, my curiosity here it comes from following your line of thinking around accumulation and accumulation cycles and thinking about what happens in, in the moments when capitalism just, like there's no pretense anymore. Uh, when, when they're like, yeah, actually all of that nonsense about meritocracy and training you for a great future and, you know, sorting people in society into the worthy and the unworthy we don't really need that anymore. Sorry, sorry, everyone. Oh, that was a lie. Um, and, and now we're just going to go to a kind of archipelago of corporate campuses, uh, walled gardens for a small elite that's needed to basically be the technocrats and functionaries of capitalism. And we're back at kind of um, surplus humanity, which many people uh, in the United States and the UK and elsewhere have already been enduring for centuries. But now there's a whole section of the population who in the post-war moment, moment were invited into the university and invited into that myth of meritocracy upon whom now they're like, well, okay, you can pay a bunch of tuition and take your, and, and gamble on your future. But really universities no longer even gonna have the pretense of doing that um, on some level. Um, and I, I fear that that is, in some ways, what comes next after, after this moment of, of COVID, that there'll be a kind of reshuffling of the deck chairs on the Titanic of capitalism, and we're going to enter into new, a new, even more brutal age of candor and human disposability. And the, the idea of the university as a lifeboat, in some ways, which was only offered, offered to some, uh, by which you could somehow achieve middle class status that that mythology will just be will just be gone and then what becomes of the politics I know I can understand what would happen to the politics of the nostalgia critical university studies who will continue to be like we need to return to the you know the new deal and the post-war compromise and the welfare states of which the university was a part and the kind of technocratically run society but then what becomes of the abolitionist university um, and this simply leads me to my final point, which is, I think, already implicit uh, in my last question, which is that, I th and I think in the examples you gave, that like already we're building what will come afterwards. Um, and those things have already been built in the streets. They're being built in the riots. They're being built as people figure out how to live and survive and take care of each other. It draws on these long, long standing traditions of how people have been reduced to. Uh, property and disposability and made subject for destruction have always uh, like studied together. Um, I, I think though that that situation is going to be much more widespread soon and the people who thought they could avoid it will no longer be allowed to avoid it. 
Um, and so I'm just very glad that the platform you've put forward and the position you put forward exists to help us navigate into those very rocky, rocky uh, shoals that are coming and that in some ways are already here and have been here for a long time. That's it for me. Great. Do you, do you want to respond to Max and then uh, we open up uh, to a QA? Do you want to respond directly to Max now or you just rather wait for the QA? Well, it might be good to take some more questions. Yeah. Okay. What, so. I'll, um, I'll uh, look out for questions, but in the meantime, I wanted to ask you also uh, a question. Um, so, yeah, what I, uh, I think uh, Max really uh, kind of nailed down uh, the, the kind of dilemma of uh, uh, an abolitionist manifesto in the sense that um, uh, on the one hand, uh, there is a lot of work to be done within universities. Uh, but on the other hand, this is uh, the work of um, criticality and the work of, uh, of uh, um, let's say, uh, um, uh, changing the institution from within, uh, at least in the UK, is often incorporated into the machine in the sense that, you know, there are people who are building uh, CVs or profiles uh, on the kind of activities that they organize. Um, and it seems very difficult, at least in a market, in a completely market-run university like the UK, to break uh, uh, from within. And um, it's also interesting, the recent article that you wrote together uh, or separately uh, really shows how Black Lives Matter uh, showed another way of, of, uh, of creating education in the streets out of, out from practices of struggles. Uh, which rem reminds me or recall the practices, for instance, of the landless movements or, or things that are happening in the South. So, um, and also there is the issue of land that is very uh, difficult to control from within. So, um, yeah, on the other hand, there's this strong drive from the right wing to dismiss university and, and, to, and to transform them in kind of little clubs, uh, uh, elitist clubs. So I guess, um, yeah, I guess I was, um, um, I was very uh, impressed by this uh, um, uh, project that you have from within universities, but which, which I think it's very effective and, 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 and kind of manages to deal with these kind of contradictions. Uh, but um, yeah, my question is, um, um, is there anything to, 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 let's say, keep from the current system uh, or, uh, you know, should be dismissed altogether? That's my quite broad question, but yeah. Um, if you want, I can take another couple of questions and um, from the um, floor. Does anybody else do want to? I might give just a quick response to Max's first question about like why the university now? Um, which I think just goes along with what you were saying already, Max, but um, I just, I find the, the right wing attack on the university be, to be somewhat disingenuous, right? It, what better way to shore up the university and liberal support for it than to kind of create it as this right wing boogeyman. Um, and we see this by the Koch brothers, for instance, continually investing in, US, in the US Academy. Um, it has not actually been abandoned. It's actually, in, maybe this is going too far, but in some ways been parallel to, um, to the law, right, to, to the courts in places where we see people making very specific investments in structuring the future through knowledge and the law um, and the way they, those work together. So I, I think I'm just not convinced of that, <laughs> of the premise that the right's actually fully against universities. I think there's a desire to transform them and defund them and to privatize them and to do and, cor and make them more corporate. Um, but I think that would be my initial response to kind of why the university now and also part of, I think why I, I continue to not go to the, the place of like blowing up the university, but trying to figure out how do we Kind of take advantage of this kind of um, concentration of resources and direct it towards um, kind of abolitionist ends in a, in a broader kind of con conceptualization of what abolition could or I, I hope will be. I could I could say just just one quick thing, picking up on on that what Abby was saying that that if we see universities as 
terrains of struggle between various kinds of political movements. Um, we can we, um, in our in our piece we, we talk about seeing seeing them as movements, and, and you can look at a right in in the current. Um, um, they uh, sorry. Um, can can you all hear me? No, you're breaking. Let me turn off my video in a second. Um, the uh, the the right one. Uh, they. All right. Sorry. So somebody else can go. I mean, I think so. W w one thing I'll say about the um, the rights relationship to the the university it's it's a, a long pro project in the making, and I think that one one of the important things about it is that the university has allowed, it's allowed the right to, because of its embeddedness in the Cold War institution making project, especially in the US, which meant that instead of direct means of, of the redistribution of wealth. They're kind of indirect mechanisms through, through, through which wealth gets redistributed. So for like some institutions that allow um, entry into careers of quote unquote sk skilled labor that allow for so social transformation at the same time as people have uh, access to government backed loans and the, the, the GI Bill, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. So like th th there's a, th this way that like the university represents one arm of a broader redistribution project. Um, then there's a, a, another way in which the university re represents uh, one arm of doing civil rights and uh, racial equality work indirectly because it becomes a means of both absor absorbing social uh, surplus populations um, and reducing unemployment in the context of, of, of the Cold War and uh, is one way of producing social mobility for racialized minorities and for women that doesn't come in the form of actual cash transfers but comes in the form to access increasing access to to professionalization and there's also the, the idea of the, the university re represents this liberal ideal of a non-instrumentalist relationship to time, uh, a relationship to time that is not entirely determined by the market. Um, and so like a, a, a condition in which time is has this relative moment, momentary autonomy from the market always needs to be uh, like, it needs to be reacted uh, against. And so the, the, the glimpse of other possibilities that can be accessed when the market does not dominate the relationship to time, and even the, the, the reproduction of the nation itself do, does not necessarily be, become the, the, the primary instance of the, the, the relationship to time. This is basically Reagan's argument against, against public education in California. Um, and I think that putting different parts of the project together are really important at this point um, because, and I, I, I'll I direct folks to uh, look at the um, the Black Statement of Solidarity uh, for cops off every campus to kind of see a little bit more of a refined version of this argument. Mm -hmm. uh, but it seems especially important to just understand that the reintroduction the the, the past 50 years, which has been this moment in the US of out of control, three times the, the rate, uh, the regular rate of inflation, um, 
in the context of overall wage stagnation, so t of tuition inflation, started right around the same time that Reagan uh, insisted on charging tuition, when right economists were insisting on charging tuition, and um, when universities started developing their own internal police departments. And I think one of the one of the most important things about the cops off campus movement is not just that we are doing budgetary analysis and showing that you know twenty uh, in the twenty nineteen twenty school year uh, the University of California spent one hundred and thirty eight million dollars uh, in, in its permanent budget on policing, and if we abolish the police, we get that one hundred thirty eight million dollars back. I think that's not the point. I think that the point is to understand what the police are there to do, which is to enforce a regime of inequality such that students and poor, increasing numbers of poor students, increasing numbers of students of color are entering into universities and paying out tuition, which is being used in order to police them, police their communities, and legitimize this, this massive practice of policing. And so by abolishing policing, we're not just saying we get that $138 million back because that $138 million is an artifact of injustice. We, we don't want to just redistribute the money that's being extracted from poor students via tuition. We want to abolish tuition. So abolishing police is one step on the route to abolishing to tuition because police give the, the form of inequality that the cops enforce uh, actual firepower. So being able to tell the story in these ways with the, the parts integrated about this 50 year period of the rights revanchism against uh, universities is a way of putting all, all, all these, these kind of often disjointed seeming pieces together into a broader story that has the capacity to build mass politics. Uh, because you bring people into the anti-policing struggle, you bring people who were in the anti-tuition struggle into the anti-policing struggle and build new, 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 a new mass politics out of that. I think it's a, it's a different route to kind of understanding the kind of collectivity that can emerge um, through these two kinds of important struggles that have been um, especially mobile in, in recent times. I have a quick follow-up question, if that's okay. And it's, it's a question both to the panel and then also to the, to the rest of the room, because I think a lot of people in this room are folks who work at slash are exploited by slash are not allowed to work at European and British universities. And I'm interested in, um, because I think the, the, what, you, what you four have presented is, is an incredible analysis of the American university and its political, economic, uh, uh, geospatial and, uh, and, and um, sociological dimensions. I wonder how it resonates for folks in other contexts, and in, in asking that question, and, and how it resonates for for you for thinking about universities overseas. Um, and in saying that, I also want to just recall um, the importance of abolitionism in its original manifestations during the nineteenth century, uh, even after the British Empire had. Uh, abolish the slave trade to working class movements in Europe um, in the sense that many prominent speakers uh, against slavery made their way to Europe and gave speaking tours that were huge um, fulcrums for the mobilization of working class people against the system. And I, I'm always, I'm always, as a Canadian, I'm always, um, or someone claimed by the nation state of Canada in various ways, I'm always a bit curious about how American, the American example functions so as not to exceptionalize it, but also to um, render it somehow useful for discussions elsewhere about its particularities, but also its similarities. So I'm curious about from you four and from everyone else in the room, what the thinking might be on that. Do you understand that answer? Give us your perspective from the US.
Okay, so Alexander, do you want to elaborate this? Uh, to Max's point, in Greece, police have been forbidden from setting foot on university campuses from 1974. But I haven't thought through whether that makes those campuses any less carceral in significant ways. That's a good point. Um, do you know that, that actually that law of immunity of universities, uh, uh, probably the new government is, is, is going to change it. But it is true that they have, um, yeah, that they have um, uh, immunity from police, uh, the Greek campuses. Um, do is, you have... Isn't part of taking away the uh, undoing that law tied to an international or transnational board of folks who've had a perspective on policing on Greek universities? That I, I believe UC Davis is, uh, the University of California Davis is former chancellor, uh, Linda Katehi, um, mm -hmm. who was an international student from Greece in the US before eventually ah. becoming chancellor at, at Davis and overseeing the pepper spraying of students back in 2011. Um, she was a mm -hmm responsible for all of that. But she was on the kind of international board of folks who were making recommendations about undoing that law. Uh, she was right. also was a student in Greece in the early 70s. Um, so there's a whole transnational kind of <laughs> movement of all these ideas um, yeah. that I think is, is important to point out. Um, yeah. My own work outside of the abolitionist project is on the recruitment um, and education of non-citizen students in the US, um, mm -hmm. which I think speaks partly to Nick's point about kind of who's paying for the policing, which is um, increasingly non-citizen students in the U.S. who are paying both for campus policing and for ICE to be on campus and policing them and um, being increasingly, you know, messed with by the, by the Trump administration and the various new policies that they're putting in place that build on longstanding um, surveillance and, and curtailments of international student life. But um, yeah, I just wanted to bring that kind of connection in because I think yeah. I, I worry sometimes about thinking about um, in these totally kind of uh, bounded ways about university systems when yeah. in fact they're so entangled in a kind of transnational frame. Interesting, yeah. Um, so, um, Katya uh, says, I work in Germany, there are no tuition here, but I don't think that uh, German university is less exploitative. And yeah, um, yeah, do you want to share your experience? Yeah, I, I think that uh, tuition is part of the issue, but the exploitation of the labor, for instance, done. Uh, th there is, in Germany, there is no real position between PhD students and um, tenured positions. So you, you spend like 10 years uh, in the limbo trying to find grants here and there or a short-term positions for two years until you write your second book that maybe allows you to apply for a tenured uh, professor position. So I, <clears throat> I think that the structure of value extraction can be done through other ways than uh, tuitions, which is uh, just uh, paying very little. <laughs> for the work and teaching and, and so on. Yeah. But it's still very a very uh, relevant discussion. Uh, I, but I, then I am, I wonder how can we apply the abolitionist perspective in European universities? What would that mean then? Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think that's a very good point in the sense that there is um, uh, there are different structures of, uh, of, of exploitation and especially of state involvement in, in uh, these uh, 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 racial and, and patriarchal uh, construction of universities. So in, 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 in Europe, uh, there is this framework that is apparently not at all market oriented, but uh, it's, it's all about building um, it's about meritocracy and it's about this kind of community of uh, knowledge that it's very, um, yeah, very elite-like, uh, but also quite bureaucratic and stay associated with, with the state. So it, it's very difficult to, yeah, to perceive these, these structures of uh, exploitation, although, of course, um, they're very uh, exclusive and intrinsically uh, racist uh, university, I think. 
at least in um, my experience in, uh, in Italy and other parts of Europe. Um, so we have a, a, a comment by Elias Bautista and how these theories fit or come into conflict when thinking about local schools, school districts, elementary, middle, high schools. I know in my high school district, they have their own police department and the lay does as well. That's a very good point. I, mean, I, I, I can talk a little bit more about that because, uh, and especially I, I know, I know Elias because uh, we, we we work together. Elias was a student at UC, UC Santa Cruz, um, and so I, I know they're talking about specifically the, the California context in which the the expansion of school school polices school policing. Um, is a same is a very similar outcome to that same Reaganite tra trajectory um, of massive divestment uh, in the California context, largely fueled through the um, the, re the kind of uh, taxpayer revolution uh, referendums in the late 1970s, like Proposition thir 13, that decimated the, the tax base, effectively decimated the, the tax base of, of public schooling, um, leading in many cases to pu pu public schooling just, just embodying the massive divestment uh, from uh, public education in general in the same way that, that had been happening in California uh, higher education for the past a decade and a half since Reagan had been elected as governor. Um, same time he was elected, elected as president, uh, these came into place. And then I think that it's important to point out here is just that one of the stories that we often tell, and this is a, going back to the critique of the, the, the crisis consensus idea, um, is that going back to this moment in which there was mass funding of high, like public higher education uh, gets us away from policing. The idea that like true education, education in its pure pure essence, is not uh, like has a has a organic di distinction from policing in theory and practice. Um, and I think that the history that we would tell about the state of, of California's uh, education system is exactly the opposite, um, where the establishment of, of higher education in the state of California is, is patently designed in order to actually fashion the California white population as police. Um, and th this is one of the reasons why the University of California is co-ed to start, because it's especially important to be training white women as teachers as part of the Settler Project. Um, so so wh white women effectively uh, express the promise of the state being able to reproduce its settler populations in particular lo location. And so higher education produces K through 12 education um, in which, you know, white women effectively promise the, the reproduction of whiteness as a form of policing against uh, na native populations. And then, so I think that like that, that logic repeats and is remade throughout the history of, of California higher education in different contexts. Divestment is just one particular expression of a larger continuity of the, the form of education as policing itself. And you see that more recently where education, the divestment becomes the rationale for the institution of further forms of policing. UC was one of the first public, first statewide system with its own uh, dedicated police system. It outpaced the rest of the country. It, it's it's uh, UCPD was established in the, in the 1940s. Most other university police departments weren't established until the 1970s. Um, and more and more California education, um, because of the crises of, of, of its divestment from education, tried to fix, quote unquote, fix its divest, the, the effects of its divestment through policing. Um, and in doing so, and I think th this is important because it, it, it connects with uh, the, the work of people like Stuart Trader, who shows how much of US anti-communist policy was done through narrating 
communism as crime. <laughs> and so like the, 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 the investment in, in, in policing is continuous with this Cold War logic of uh, fighting communism through, through fighting crime domestically. Um, and so the investment in school police stations, the idea that schools actually need their own dedicated police um, is a continuous effect of the, the, the divestment in communities. I know that in Oakland in 2010, um, when, as, as a result of the recession, um, the Oakland, Oakland budget almost never cuts police, but for the first time in its, re its recent uh, history, it had to actually, you know, fire a couple of police officers. It, at the same time, applied for a federal grant, allowing it to establish an Oakland school police station that rehired the same officers that had been fired from the Oakland police into the Oakland schools. So policing becomes a way of actually making it so that cops don't feel the effect of recession in the way that everyone else feels. And even as the austerity devastates communities even more and more, police continue to benefit off of it through the, the, the continued societal investment in policing. So the, the, the relationship between education and policing is really important. It also helps us get to the idea of cops off campus. The idea isn't to return education to this primordial state <laughs> where, where like it, it was founded without cops. It's actually to do something that has historically never been the case in US higher education, which has been to free higher education from policing in the first place. It's never been done. And so we're trying to imagine what it would be like for it to be done, education free of policing. That's my response. Great. Is there anybody who can report on the UK experience in response to Max? I don't, I don't know if there are many British listeners here. Well, I mean, I think that um, with regard to university, UK is a very uh, peculiar space in the sense that I, I and, and also uh, in relationship to the state and state policing. Uh, it's um, in a way that the, 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 the university, I mean, I think it kind of fits in the same periodization that Eli was, was talking about, the kind of uh, post-war consensus of a university as part of a, uh, forging a new uh, uh, public. Um, but in a way, the university higher education is so elitist here. And also this new public space was uh, always very precarious in the sense that came out really from uh, a, a small period from the beginning of 20th century to the 80s in which uh, this, this uh, you know, this kind of uh, project of the public was uh, tried out and, and I guess also quite violently with it, its own structure of policing. Um, but it seems that we're gonna go back very quickly to this um, you know, aristocratic structure in which uh, higher education uh, doesn't exist at all and it's not uh, an issue. I think this um, um, investment in policing and education was more probably more intensive in the primary education and secondary education rather than higher education. But it's coming here now, so it's, it's very important to have the discussion because I think it's, it, this is now what's happening, uh, definitely, uh, with the new, yeah, with the new reorganization of the university. So it's, it's, it's going to be wonderful and very, um, very important that we liaise with this project and um, we're going to distribute your link and we're going to make connections at Goldsmith for sure. I was a question actually building on Katya's point from earlier, um, that if the university right, isn't only cumulative through the product, this is an argument we make in the longer version of the invitation, right, that the accumulation or work or function of the university for accumulation projects is not just through the collection of tuition, um, but it's also how the university serves as a site for the circulation of, of capital, right? And through the circulation of capital, the movement of capital, the accumulation of capital elsewhere, not in the university specifically as, as nonprofits in the US. 
Um, but also, and this is a point I think Nick has made a few times in, in a few places, but the kind of holding of, of surplus populations in the university that is necessary to kind of, and we make this briefly in the, in the version we presented today too, but um, the kind of covering over of the unemployment that is central to uh, kind of contemporary capitalism. And so I wonder, because I'm wondering like, how that is, is one of the functions that the university serves in a tuitionless uh, university in, in Germany, in the German context that Katya was speaking to. Um, but also what, what happens to the surplus populations if there is this kind of end of the university or, um, or shrinking of the university that, that you were just speaking to? Like what, this is actually Max's question, Max's question also, but what comes after, whether it's after COVID or is it after the university, if, if we see this kind of um, sh movement away from the university that goes towards other ends and the ones that we're, we're laying out um, as part of the abolitionist project? Mm -hmm. Katia, do you want to respond? Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I think that it, that's exactly what was said before. It's this, this, the fact that not everyone has a college degree in Europe. So there is this aristocratic dimension, I would say, where the surplus population uh, does without higher education. Um, and, and, and have jobs. And there is also, also this parallel system uh, in Germany and in Switzerland where, where I come from, where people can, can uh, be, um, uh, tr have this training in, in specific uh, works outside of the university. And so they have, a, in Switzerland, uh, builders or uh, people who are doing woodwork and so on can have very good salaries without uh, having gone to the university uh, but it's it's changing the, the the in Switzerland the desire of the state is to bring more and more uh, people to the university and I think in Germany it's the same so pushing people to go to the university while not offering uh, yeah maybe that's what you do with surplus population what what you to your point, to your point, yeah, that's, thank you. Um, yeah, um, there is a similar situation in the UK now, uh, there is the idea that higher education is going to be turned into further education, uh, much more technical training, vocational training, such as uh, Germany. And, and this is something that our uh, uh, Prime Minister is pushing, obviously, from a perspective of Oxford educated. Um, so a lot of university will be closed down effectively or the university new labor open in the 90s will be closed down in that, in that kind of optic and it's 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 a uh, it's a bit uh, um, you know uh, yeah uh, irony that that of course this university new labor created are really the have been the engine of of financialization uh, uh, you know of the economy and the new labor too so it's uh, um, yeah, it's um, there's not much uh, uh, positive alternative, let's say. Um, there is a comment from yeah Wendy. Um, I appreciate the critique of the romanticization of the mid 20th century uh, public university model because the post World War II period was when the U.S. military government authorized the establishment of Okinawa's first university. Roughly two types of students emerge out of the university. Those who were fed into military occupation bureaucracy and those who become transient critics of US imperialism. The latter participated in land struggles outside the university, which was policed by the former, who were trained as native translators and civil servants and land surveyors. Okinawa as a space was in the meantime transformed into a launch pad for the US imperialist project throughout the Asia Pacific, most notably Vietnam. That's really super interesting. Thank you. Yeah. I also think that, you know, that w w what that brings up is just how much w w we've talked a little bit about how inflected the U.S. example is by like the U.S. history of the university is by its role in the Cold War. Um, it, it's also inflected by, in many cases, and I think th this is like a, a case that actually proves 
something that we don't always look at in the context of the, U the U.S. university. It's because U.S. management of surplus populations has was not so trained on the colony versus metropole distinction. Um, and because, like, in the spatial distinction b between co colony and and metropole, um, and because of that, a, a lot of the the kind of phenomena that are really were were incredibly important in the structuring. I know of UK universities, like the idea of uh, like a, a deeply deeply held investment in the idea of meritocracy. Mm -hmm. um, where the university isn't the same kind of, of mass project, especially because that meritocratic idea has everything to do with the ability of the university to manage the relationships between colony and metropole. Because it's not, there, there's not the same injunction, there's not the same necessity to build a university that can absorb surplus populations because the surplus populations are elsewhere. The sur 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 the, well, the, the surplus populations in the colonies are not the ones that, that, that the universities were worried about managing directly. It's worried about managing them indirectly through the absorption of populations from those colonies that it can interpolate as exceptional. Um, it can interpolate as the truly meritocratic and it can, it, it can um, instrumentalize in order to, in, in attempts to build a colonial governing class, uh, which the U.S. began to, in, in, in the 60s, really envy in many cases, and you'll, you'll see this in the documents of, of a lot of the U US, um, U.S. university administrators uh, when they're st starting to manage Black Studies programs because <laughs> they start reaching out to British universities and they start re reaching out to West Indian universities because they, they want to build their Black Studies programs managed by West Indian intellectuals because there's a narrative that West Indian intellectuals are invested in the idea of meritocracy. They are not invested in the idea of social unrest. They will not identify with Black students. In fact, they will see that Black students who are, who are in U.S. universities were brought there by affirmative action programs and they will regard them as less deserving because they have not been brought up in the same meritocratic system as people who have come through the British system. So people like, and I can say this now, Orlando Patterson um, were like explicitly brought, brought into U.S. universities like Harvard because they, they, they expected them to disidentify with Black students. Um, and they, they thought that they would have a counter, counterinsurgent effect on student uprisings. And I'm saying this, you can go into the archives and, and look at it. They're in Ewart Whittier's paper in the Schomburg Center. Uh, they're, they're right there. Um, and yeah, but like why they, they turned to try and absorb uh, intellectuals from the West Indies. In fact, they actually, this is a funny story for uh, the, the, um, the, the third world historians. They, they uh, reached out to the University of West Indies uh, asking about Walter Rodney um, and asking uh, if Walter Rodney would be a good person to help build their Black Studies program. And the president of the University of West Indies said, no, nah, he tried to form a, form a revolution here. We kicked him out of the country. And so like that kind of gives you a sense of like how the, the, the two different systems alongside each other, but also how they inter, how, how different populations project projects interface with each other and yeah. their differences became systemically important to each other. Wow. That is a fascinating story. <laughs> yes. um, I wanted to bring up something about the UK and maybe to a lesser extent Germany and France to the extent I have any understanding whatsoever about those academic contexts, which is to note that um, like the UK until very recently, certainly under like new labor, um, saw the university sector as a massive growth industry that they could milk by by playing on that reputation of being the metropolitan elite uh, merit meritocratic university and kind of leveraging that into the um, the kind of fulcrum of a knowledge economy and creative economy and that sort of thing and I think the the, the that lure is uh, being revealed for what it always was especially when UK when when um, non-UK students were being forced to pay exorbitant tuition fees and still are being forced to pay exorbitant tuition fees that essentially prop up the entire UK university system. And it makes me think about um, 
what that then means, because, uh, you know, in the UK, a lot of the students who are studying in the UK from overseas are the modern uh, manage professional managerial class and or ruling class or and or aristocracy of many countries around the world, especially uh, former for, formerly colonized nations. And it makes me think about that in terms of our discussion of the management of surplus populations, because on the one hand, there's the university as a mechanism by which the, surpl the surplus population within the nation state is managed by these kind of methods of social sorting and uh, hierarchization and meritocracy. But then it's also really interesting as we're discussing to think about it as the way in which a global problem of surplus populations are managed. And it makes me think of then about the the way in which in the UK university and the German university and the French university, the site of that management and perhaps the site of the greatest repression of student protest over the last 20 years has been targeted at Palestinians. And we can look at the event that happened at King's College in the last year and a half where the government, the, the university government basically handed all the student records to the police uh, during a demonstration by Palestinian students and, and supporters of human rights in Palestine. Um, in, in a kind of unprecedented fashion for the UK. And was for, then there was a huge inquiry and they were forced to apologize and implement a whole bunch of new regulations saying they wouldn't hand over this information to the police. Uh, but that was one of the bigger events, or we can think about the way in which uh, largely racialized students led a recent occupation of goldsmiths, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the thing that makes me think about Palestine is that, you know, Palestine on some levels, is, as a number of Palestinian theorists have noted, has become the kind of global signifier for the or, and the kind of stage for showing everyone around the world what happens to surplus populations when there's you know when they're left to be annihilated or uh, uh, liquidated in some sense um and it's interesting to me that in the last few years palestinian solidarity activism has become such a target of the increasingly militarized police university um I'm curious how to piece all those pieces together, uh, especially as it relates to Europe. And, you know, um, that seems to me to be the space where I see the most kind of police repression on university campuses and the most, and also the most policing of um, speech as well. Yeah, that's a very good point. also on American campuses, of course. Well, there's a lot to, yeah, a lot to think about this um, uh, connection and solidarities and, and, um, and possible collaborations um, in the sense that we, yeah, with, um, I think, I mean, going back to the Zoom discussion that Nick was touching upon, it's, it's really a crazy time in the sense that we are also uh, communicating with our students on Zoom. And uh, uh, obviously, uh, some of us want to meet uh, face to face and, and, and trying to, 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 uh, to push the moment and to try to uh, force um, uh, the college you know, structural change in the college and this uh, uh, of, uh, police of the campus project would be one of them. Um, but it's very difficult to, to gauge the, the possibility of, uh, of uh, activism now in university, inside universities. So, but um, yeah, I'd, um, I'd be really happy to continue the conversation and to, um, to start with this project and um, maybe um, I will get in touch with you and ask you, you know, practically how, how you made it and, uh, you know, some, some suggestion how to start it in Goldsmith. And uh, I mean, we have already structure in place and obviously after the anti-racist uh, occupation, uh, we have some collectives that are quite active on campus. Um, but yeah, this is certainly something that I'd like to, to, to push and to work with you. Uh, if possible. Um, Katia was also commenting. Oh, that's interesting. I can't remember was allowed to talk during a conference because of his writing on the Palestinian situation. He was accused of anti-Semitism. 
Yeah, it was a huge, huge situation mm. uh, discussion in the media. So it was just to your point, Max, very mm. <laughs> well seen. That, that's exactly right. Yeah. yeah I referenced the fact that Leila Khalid um, was stopped from speaking on Zoom and then also on Facebook and on YouTube um, in, in kind of Palestinian solidarity project um, as, as a Palestinian person who was also you know, arrested in a longer history. But there's always the Zoom is also part of that, right? It's not yeah. other space. Yeah. Okay. So well, thank you very much. And, and um, we'd be in touch hopefully and, and good luck with your struggles and with your teaching. <laughs> And uh, yeah, and we'll be in touch soon and, and continue the conversation. Thank you so thank much you. for having us. Yeah, thank you for having us. This is great to talk to everyone. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very much. Bye bye. Thank you very much.